So welcome to Accidentally Awesome, Angela. I've known Angela for a long, long time. I mean, what is it? 12 years, maybe? Probably even longer. Maybe even longer. Yeah, I used to do Angela's marketing marketing way back when I was in in that area. And she had a, a fantastic clinic called the Amber Tree. And it was all about women's health. Um, yeah. So that's what you focused on. And it was just, um, yeah, it was fun. We did expos and things like that. So, but um, since then, Angela has moved on a little bit and she's now a menopause coach, but she's been a naturopath for what, over 20 years? Just on 20 years, yeah. Yeah. And before that, you were an accountant. Is that right? Uh, I'm a qualified accountant. Before that, I was a project manager. So I used to manage um, large IT and finance company projects. Yes, yeah. And you stopped that um, when you started having your own health issues and you were trying to fall pregnant yes. yourself yeah. and then retrain, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, so I um, I kind of, I had a miscarriage at work and that was kind of a bit of an aha moment for me. And I realised that the life I was leading, which was highly stressful jobs, travelling and all that really wasn't um, conducive to me because at that stage I was trying to fall pregnant. Mm-hmm. It wasn't conducive to, to me falling pregnant. It wasn't great for my health. So I decided to take a few months off work, um, told my husband three months and actually I was thinking six. <laughs> and I decided to go and investigate this thing called naturopathy because I didn't really know too much about it, but I've always had this interest in the way the body works. So yes. off I went to um, naturopathic school thinking, yeah, I'll, I'll do one term and just get, just kind of, I just did a, kind of the, the general subjects. And then a month later I was pregnant with my son and the rest is history. So I yes. went on to co- complete all my studies, do my degree, had two children whilst I was um, studying. So for most of the time I was studying, I was either pregnant or breastfeeding, uh-huh. um, and <laughs> which was fun in itself. And when I kind of came, uh, when I um, finished studying, then I, that's kind of when I met you and because I was running a, a physical clinic then, but I have been doing online work now for many, or well, probably about six or seven years, I've actually been online and doing all my yes. work online, but I, I don't, um, I don't work this as a, well, I am still a naturopath, obviously I'm still a qualified naturopath, but I don't work in a similar way to what most naturopaths do anymore. Mm-hmm. I work more in a coaching role because I'm also, I'm a kinesiologist plus a personalized health coach. Yeah. And one of the things I found is when I was working with clients, um, it, it kind of got to the stage where people were just coming to me because my pills were safer than the doctor's pills. Yeah, wow. what I wanted to do was to teach them how to eat properly and how to have a better lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And and still today, I mean, when if someone wants to have, I don't do one-on-one appointments, but if someone wants to work, you know, they come to me and they say, can I do an appointment? I want to know what to take for. I go, actually, I don't work like that. It's like, let's work out what's going on and adjust the diet and the lifestyle because that will fix a lot of your problems up. And then sometimes on top, I might then prescribe a little bit to get people through because they may need a little bit of assistance. But the aim is to actually have them eating according to what their body requires and living a lifestyle according to what their body requires, understanding that everybody is different because they yeah. do personalised health, which is genetic-based personalised health. So based on your, your genetic profile and what we call epigenetics, um, we're able to determine specifically what your body requires, which is different to what someone else's body requires, because everyone is individual. Everybody has different genes. Everybody has a different um, history. They've got different health history. They've got different beliefs. And all of, so everyone's different. So, yeah. every, so when, it's, it's when good I, to have it personalized to what suits yeah, totally. your body. Because what works for me won't work for you. Yeah. And then you know, and won't work for the next person. And this is the problem when we get into this oh, we're all going to do diets. So we'll all do the keto diet. Now, I was always a big proponent of the keto diet, but I now know keto diet now for me in this next stage of life through menopause doesn't work. Used to always work for me, doesn't work now because my body has changed. And it doesn't work for many people. Yet what happens is people try these diets because they work for their friend and then- Wonder why it's not working for them. And they think that they're a failure, but it's not them. It's just it wasn't the right thing for their body. Yeah, and it, it's not just that. It might not be the right thing at that time. That's right. And you know, you might not be able to put that focus on it 
at that time. Yeah. Um, but also, because I with know menopause. that I've put on quite a lot of weight since having the kids. And having got my ADHD diagnosis this year, and I've been starting to read into it and understand it a lot better. And I can see why that has happened. Because for me, getting that ADHD diagnosis, whereas I coped right up until then, I was, you know, very successful at doing what I was doing. But as soon as I had both kids, the wheels fell off. Mm. You know, I had two little people to look after. I was struggling a lot. I had PTSD, postnatal depression. And now I know on top of that, I also had ADHD, which, you know, and um, as well as that postpartum hormone stuff going on. So it's not just about you as a person. It can be you as what's going on in, in right. your life. Yeah. And as your hormones change, regardless of what's going on, whether or not it's pregnancy hormones, it's um, your reproductive hormones are coming down because you're coming through perimenopause and beyond. As your hormones change, your body changes. And we, I mean, we, we get this and we understand this in pregnancy. It's amazing. Yeah. We understand this in pregnancy. We know that our hormones change and our body changes. And it's not just the fact that, you know, our stomach gets bigger, you know, our uh, joints get looser because, you know, everything relaxes. And we, we can understand that our body changes based on our hormones when we're pregnant. But women have a problem understanding that their body changes when their hormones change as they're coming into perimenopause and beyond. They exactly. kind of want their body to stay the same, but it will change because yeah. hormones Yeah, and it's a natural process. It I think and part of that is, um, and I'm, I'm going to put it out here, I think social media has got a lot to do with that. Mm -hmm. um, although I have to say, I think social media and the media in general is actually starting to get on the perimenopause and menopause bandwagon people are starting to be more open about it and actually start yes, these discussions yes and, no. and it's only been in the last year or so that i've seen this happening yeah it's there's a two it's a two um double what is a two-sided coin to this because yeah. what or what's driving a lot of the conversation at the moment is the pharmaceutical companies mm. because See, way back about, oh, it was about 15 years ago, hormone replacement, they did, uh, I'm not sure if you're, you're probably aware, the Women's Health Initiative came out and said that hormone replacement therapy, HRT, was high risk for breast cancer um, for women. So there was kind of this big fear against it. Before that, HRT was the highest prescribed drug in the world. Wow. So yeah. you can imagine what that did to the pharmaceutical companies when all of a sudden everybody stopped buying it. Yeah. And um, at that stage, that was a synthetic form of um, hormone and it wasn't good for us. So what they kind of done over the years is um, they kind of changed it. And now they use what's known as bioidentical hormones, uh -huh. um, which are made from plants and they're supposed to be the same as our, our what we make naturally. The thing is, they're not exactly the same. They're cis version. So basically they're opposite. They're, they're opposite because we can only manufacture externally something that's an, a mirror image. So basically yeah. it's a mirror image. But it works the same way in our body. And so now that's what they're pushing. And obviously mm -hmm. the pharmaceutical companies want more and more women to take it up. And it's been, I know, because um, obviously if you're from the UK, even though you live here, but there's a really big push over there. And they've got some um, quite... Um, um, influential people to be going out and talking about this, and um, mm. and it, that they're all saying that every woman needs to be going, needs to be on HRT. It, that menopause is only ever going to be a struggle. There's no other way to do it. It's the worst time of your life. So the narrative is that menopause is just an absolutely disgusting time of life, and the only way you can solve it is by you taking HRT or MHT is what they call. Yeah, well, one of, that was one of the questions that we'd had from. Um, the community was about HRT. She has never been offered it. And I think from what she said, she's now post menopause. So she's yeah. through it. And should she be taking it now? Uh, no, it's not recommended for women once they're through menopause, through menopause, and once they're post, post menopausal. Mm -hmm. But let's have a little bit of a discussion about what happens with the hormones. Yeah. Um, as women are coming through this stage of life. So before we even get on to what you're going to do about it, let's yeah. talk about exactly what's happening. So 
as women kind of get to their late 30s, early 40s, their hormones start to shift. There is a bit of a shift. And um, when we're in our reproductive stage of life, our brain connects to our ovaries and it, the brain tells the ovaries each month to release some um, estrogen. And when the estrogen levels come up, basically that releases an egg. And once the egg comes out, there's progesterone within the egg, releases the egg. So the egg come, releases day 14. Yep. And then um, estrogen comes back down and progesterone goes up because the egg's now been released. Mm. Mm -hmm. and either you fall pregnant and your progesterone level continues to go up for the first three months or you don't fall pregnant, it drops off and then you have a period. So that's kind of how the cycle- That's our cycle happens. when you're in so that sort of stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then as we kind of get to late early 30s, oh, sorry, early 40s, so late 30s, it can be late 30s, early 40s, this starts to change because we're running out of egg supply or the eggs we've got are not the same quality. Yeah. So over the next few years, years what will be happening is that not every month you'll be releasing an egg so not every month will your progesterone be coming up or the eggs not a good enough quality so there's no progesterone so progesterone starts to come down just a little bit uh -huh. and, as, as, a, as opposed to the estrogen levels which are generally and most women even before we get to this stage of life have too much estrogen so the majority of women these days in age have what is known as estrogen dominance and what that means is they've got higher than normal estrogen levels. And this is created by our lifestyle. It's uh -huh. been created by things like the pill, um, some of the foods that we eat, um, things that we call endo dis uh, endocrine disruptors, which are in yep. plastics, they're in cosmetics and all that. So uh, we actually have a higher level of estrogen than what, we're, than what we would have had without this interference. Mm -hmm. So estrogen is higher than and progesterone is coming down. It's this difference that starts to cause symptoms. And then periods start to get a little bit irregular. Maybe they might, might be longer between periods. So rather than the 28, 29 days, it might go, you know, move out to 40 days, 60 days or whatever. Mm. And could get I here. know myself um, after having kids, I mean, I, I'm a later in life mum, like as you were as well. Yeah. Um, so I had my son just before my 41st birthday, my daughter when I was 42. And after I had them, I found my periods were horrendous, absolutely yes. horrendous. It was and like, you know, that when, when in The Shining, where yeah. the lift doors open, it's like, whoosh. Yes. And I've heard so, so many of my friends have a similar issue. So is this because we've had kids or is this our hormones it's, changing? It's a, comb it's a, it's a combination of the timing of when you had to so I was I was similar I actually I'm going to say that um, because I breastfed until I was 45 yeah and in that time I actually went to almost perfect periods first time I'd had perfect periods in years I've mm. had so many issues but what happens for many women particularly as they're having their um, children late is that so we've had this massive change in hormones when you're pregnant mm -hmm. and then you give birth and then you kind of come out and you're kind of moving into perimenopause. So yep. hormones are kind of, they're everywhere and the brain's kind of trying to communicate with the ovaries and the ovaries are trying to communicate back. And there's just all these mixed messages going on because the brain's kind of, we've got to remember that even though we're having children later in life, evolutionarily, that's not the way, you know, we were, our bodies, we're, women's bodies were designed to be having children, you know, in our late teens, early twenties, yeah, exactly. So that's kind of how the body works, and then, and because then, yeah, when we get to this this stage of life, you know, forties or so, it's when our fertility kind of wanes, and mm. we, you know, go into menopause. But we're kind of doing it differently the way that we're living these days. So that kind of really stuffs the, our body up, yeah. And then, then we can experience symptoms, and then we've got to look on top of that. What else is going on? Because hormone shifting hormones are meant to shift they they change they change every month they change, and when you're in perimenopause they change day by day yeah they're meant to change but we've got to look beyond the hormones why is the change in hormones causing these symptoms why what's going on and generally what you, you know not generally all the time what you'll find underlying there there is stress yeah so there is the stress of childbirth. There is the stress of raising young children. That you know, that's all very, very stressful. Mm. And if you're at the same time as your body's kind of 
reducing its fertility and going through perimenopause, the more stress you put in there, the worse the symptoms become. Mm-hmm. And it just throws and it throws hormones out even more. So the underlying cause of all of this is really stress. And then when we look at that, what is stress? Well, stress is also, stress is not just, yeah, okay, I didn't have a good night's sleep because my baby kept me up or I had a fight with my husband. Stress is the food that I'm eating. You know, the, yeah. how is the food that you're eating impacting the, your gut? So what's your yeah, gut and if, like? And if you've got a little one, you know what it's like. You tend to just eat what you can. That's right. time. And it's, that is not always the best of things for you. Um, no, I've actually not. taken to more problems. making myself a bit of a snack box when I'm making the kids' lunches now. So I've got a box that's all divided up and I've been putting in hummus and nuts and grapes and carrots and things like that because having ADHD, I like that dopamine crunchy food thing. But I was aware that I'd been eating crackers and chips and uh, and I hadn't been feeling good so I deliberately have been making the change to try and improve what I'm eating our meals are great don't get me wrong there but my snacks were were shocking so when we're talking about menopause I'd, I'd been listening to one of your podcasts and I loved what you said that it's I'm going to read this out here um <laughs> Menopause isn't a diagnosis, it's a stage of life, which is exactly right. And, you know, I think it has become so um, diagnosed is the bit uh, to yeah, use totally. your word, you know, and it, it's wrong. It's, it's, and I think this is why I like the fact that we are all now starting to talk about perimenopause and menopause. It's a natural part of our lives. Um, like just going through puberty, as you'd said in this mm-hmm. the podcast that I'd been listening to. And um, so how are we best able to look after ourselves when when this is starting to happen, when we start to notice changes, changes? What's the best way we can advocate for ourselves if we do go and see somebody in the health sector? Well, ideally, this starts before you ever get there. Yeah. So the more very work you can do, the better. And it is. And it's, look, it's not rocket science. Yeah. It's eating well. It's moving well. It's reducing the toxins from your environment. It's reducing your stress in your environment. And it's your mindset. And mindset plays a really big role because if you mm. think that, that menopause is going to be the crappiest time of your life, menopause will be the crappiest time of your life. Yeah. So it's like we've got to, you know, when we look at these things and then when we just putting and also look at what ADHD is, now, ADHD has a really strong gut component. So it's a yeah. gut-brain connection. So once again, the more you can eat well and get your gut working properly, because the gut, gut's the second brain. There's more yes. serotonin in the gut than there is in the brain. So the better your gut is working, the better you will feel. And that will be from the ADHD point of view, as well as from your hormone point of view, because when your body's working properly, Mm-hmm. It's not stressed. Your gut's healthy. Your liver's healthy. It's not stressed. So then the adrenal glands, which are designed to take up the production of hormones once your ovaries shut down, the adrenal glands will do their job. Because, mm-hmm. But what happens is most women, by the time they get to this time of life, they're so exhausted and the adrenal glands are just pushing to just pump out enough cortisol to keep them alive or keep yeah. them functioning that it doesn't create the required estrogen and progesterone, but our body can produce this. Even though once our um, ovaries have stopped producing eggs, mm. our our body can produce the amount of hormone that we require because we don't need as much anymore because we're no longer ovulating. We're no longer yeah. preparing our body for pregnancy. We only need small amounts and those amounts are protection for our brain, our heart, our bones and all of that. Mm-hmm. And, and what the reason why so many women experience issues is because their adrenal glands are so totally worn out and the other thing that happens is when we as our um, estrogen and progesterone levels come down estrogen and progesterone are both protective hormones because they're designed to keep us alive so we can reproduce and populate the world yeah so they're very protective so as that level comes down we lose the protection so what we start to see the symptoms we start to see have kind of been hidden they were there that, you know, this is a sign of us not eating properly and not looking after ourselves. They were there, but the hormones covered it up. Yeah. Now the hormones reveals it. So 
what you used to be able to get away with in your 20s and your 30s, you cannot get away with in your 40s, your 50s and 60s and beyond. So it's yeah, like, and that's so true. And I, I think you're right. You know, we we start to see it in certain things. You know, I, I very rarely go out at nights and I very rarely drink. But the times that I do go out and I do have a drink, boy, do I feel it the next day. And yeah, I don't and drink you probably much. have a bad night's sleep. Oh, yeah. I have a terrible night's sleep. Yeah, um, because the effect of, on your liver. Yeah, exactly. And that just shows that, you know, our body does you know, change the way that it can deal with things. And that's you know something that we're and doing to ourselves. Alcohol is a big one because the largest consumer of wine in this country are women over the age of 45. Right. Um, and it's just very common. You know, I'm stressed. I'm going to have a glass or two or three of wine. A yeah, night. that's a very that, common thing that you see people that talking makes about. It, that makes hot flushes worse. It makes mm -hmm. night sweats worse. It makes joint aches and pains worse. So it makes a lot of the symptoms worse they're actually it's the alcohol that if you're having night sweats generally i'll pretty much guarantee that you had a glass of wine for dinner yeah well i notice that if i have a glass of wine on a saturday night <laughs> i'm like this yes <laughs> Ooh, open the window <laughs> so i don't say don't drink wine but just know that there's a connection so if yeah, you exactly. want the night sweats to stop you drink the wine, but if you're if you want the wine, just know that you're going to get the night sweats, and that so would educate come, yourself. Yeah, or you know, or you're going to be waking up going to the toilet, or you're not going to get a good night's sleep. So it, it's it's all about for me. It, I just see that I give information, and once you've got information, you choose what you want to do. It's one of the reasons why I do coaching now rather than working one on one because people were taking my advice and it was <laughs> frustrating me. So now I go okay. Your Tell us a little bit about the coaching that you offer. I've um, I downloaded your um, your free book that you have on oh, your yeah, website, I, I and I had a quick look through it. Belly. And I think from what I've read about it, I'm a diplomat. Yeah, you are. That's what I associated <laughs> myself with. And if you download Angela's book, which I will put in the comments, you can have a look at it. So I read um, through them, and I was like, oh, maybe I'm this, maybe I'm that. Then I thought. No, that's me there. I'm a diplomat. Um, yeah, no. So basically, um, with my what I do is I work, I only do group programs. So I have a program, a 10-week program called Embrace. And I also run a five-day free workshop beforehand. So basically, people get the ebook, they learn a little bit about what I do, and then they can come along and do the workshop. And I teach them a little bit more about this personalized health, about understanding what health type you are and the best way for you to eat and move and mm -hmm. all that. And then those that want to come on and work with me for 10 weeks, then they get a specific personalized profile, which is like a specific list of foods, you know, the right mm. type of exercise, the right time to eat, all of that. So mm. that's a more in-depth. And then we also go into a lot of other different areas of life because it's not just about food. Everyone thinks it's all about food. It's actually not. Um even weight, it's not all about food. It's very rarely it is about food. Um, there, it's a, it's all about how how is your body stressed and what can we do to change it? And it's different mm -hmm. for everybody because different body types or different health types get stressed by different things. So you say you're a diplomat. What stresses a diplomat is when someone kind of puts time constraints on them. Diplomats like to actually think about things and do things in their own time. But if someone mm -hmm. says you've got to do it now, 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 now. That would freak me out. Yeah. And I and think that's a lot of us women with ADHD. You know, there's yeah. so many more women being diagnosed later in life, you know, in their 30s, in their 40s, when they realize that their kids have got ADHD and they start looking into it. And then they're like, oh, hang on, that's me, because that's exactly what happened with me. Yeah. Um, so if we're talking about um, hormones and ADHD, what can we do to support ourselves there? Is there anything extra that we can be doing? And really, it's the same stuff. It's just, you know, making sure that you're eating the right foods. And when I, you know, we look at health, type, it, I think this is where when you understand your personal health type, it makes a lot of, it makes a big difference because then you kind of go, oh, now I understand that my biology, this is the way my body works. So when you mm. kind of go, okay, as a diplomat, 
it's natural for me to do things slower. A slow start in the morning is really good for me. I don't like to be put on, under too much pressure. I'll do things in my own time, but I will get things done. And I'm very system orientated. So I like to know that there's a you know, process. So I'm a diplomat. And so, you know, when you kind of understand that that's how your brain works and that's the physiology of your brain, you can go, oh, that's me. But then if you were, say, an activator, an activator who can bounce out of bed at six o'clock in the morning, they're ready to go, they're off doing boot camp, they're doing exercise, they're always moving. And to us um, diplomats, we think, God, they're an energizer bunny, they're just too much. But if you, and because they've been told their whole life they're too much because they're the kid that yeah. always used to run around the classroom and was probably diagnosed as being hyperactive. And they were told to sit in a chair and they couldn't sit still and things like that. That's my but daughter. Yeah, and yeah, and you get to when we get to you know, I mean, I'm working with women in their mid stage of life, and they go, oh, that's why. That's mm -hmm. my natural way of being. Yeah. And now they've got permission to be who they are, and, and I think it makes a massive difference. Also, getting that ADHD diagnosis has given me a lot of permission, um, and I'm very open about having the diagnosis. I'd put it up on my Facebook page a personal one and um, I let it sit for a couple of weeks just you know to take it in figure it out and I thought you know what I've, I've got no shame about having this diagnosis and I shouldn't have any shame and I'm going to share it with people because there are a lot of people underdiagnosed a lot of women underdiagnosed and I'm always been the sort of person that thinks knowledge is power and if you've got something going on own it Educate mm. yourself, find out what works for you. Um, I mean, I did take uh, the medication that I was offered by the psychiatrist because I was at the point where I felt I needed something. Um, I was struggling day to day and it has made a massive difference to me just getting that brain chemistry yep. calmed down because my hyperactivity is definitely in my mind these days um yeah, that's, a, that's a bit of a diplomat thing too <laughs> is it because <laughs> yeah. that's it when so, you start to discover a little bit about you know how different brains work you kind of when you can accept that and as you say yeah. once you accept it instead of trying to fight it instead of trying to be like someone else be you yourself know, actually, this is the way i am yeah and that's okay and and i think because the way, the reason why um, menopause brings a lot of this out is because there is a rewiring of the brain mm -hmm. as we can, because no longer is it communicating with the ovaries, it starts communicating with the um, adrenal glands. And, yeah. you know, it was getting messages, like it was relying on estrogen and progesterone and things like that. It will still get it, but it's got to get it from the adrenal glands. And if the adrenals aren't working, it's not getting the messages that it requires. So, there is like a five year rewiring that happens. And this is when a lot of women now are being diagnosed. Yeah. And it's a really great opportunity to um, actually start to go, well, okay, so what is it that I want for the rest of my life? And how can I make changes to support my brain and my body? Because there is this rewiring and I would prefer mm. to rewire the way I want it to rewire not in chaos because if you yeah. don't do something about it it will rewire in chaos and that's part so of what i'm your food and your movement and all of that yeah. makes a difference and i'm starting to work on that myself it's like well what time of the day is the best time for me and although you're saying diplomats first thing in the morning isn't good for me but that's fine because i need to get the kids sorted out get them to school and by the time i get home about you know 9 30 ish I'm ready to get started. Yeah, um, so best. So, so what happens then for you as diplomats? And um, yes, yeah, sometimes, you know, because life is there and we've got things to do. So ideally what you would do and what will make life less stressful is that you, if you've planned things the night before. I have so been. you've got the, yeah. So, and that's it. So you can't get over the fact that you've got to get the kids up early, but you want to make it as stress-free as possible. So Yeah, and we've got a great everything. routine in the morning now. Yeah. And even when I get home with the, um, from dropping them off, I, like you say, have a bit of a slow start. So I sit down, I don't check emails or anything, but I do my journal in the morning. Yeah. Um, I'll check a few things that I'm logging, you know, so I've been um, making sure that I'm getting my, my exercise steps in. So I'll write that down for the previous day. 
Um, I'll have planned what exercise I'm going to do that day. So I'll either exercise first and then journal or journal then exercise. Um, so yeah, I do take, a, it takes me until about 11 o'clock to really kick in yeah. and get going. And I think um, whether it's menopause, perimenopause or whatever, I think we can all benefit from knowing ourselves better and actually understanding how we work as people. Totally. Yeah, and, and accepting that that's who you are. And be yeah. because when you're a diplomat guardian who require a slower start in the day, it's difficult when you live in a fast paced world and everybody wants you to get up and be running from five o'clock in the morning. You know, that miracle morning is like, you know, get up at five o'clock and do all no. these things in the first hour. It's like, no, <laughs> I'm dragging myself out of bed at seven o'clock. And so, I'm still like, no, I want to sleep. <laughs> yeah, it's like, and and then we start to feel like that there's something wrong with us because we don't have that go, go, go first thing in the morning. But when you realise you were never designed to, no, you, exactly. your body's not actually designed to be like that. Yeah. And by being like that, all you're doing is stressing your body, which is causing more issues. Yeah. Then uh, that's when we, you know, that's when we, we come into problems and mm -hmm. yeah. hormones, life and everything, health all starts to mm -hmm. uh, be um, affected. Yeah. I've got one more question for you from um, the community, and this is from Tina. And she asks, um, is there anything we can do to manage the drop in progesterone in our cycle? So that's like the second part of our cycle after ovulation. Um, well, the, the drop in progesterone comes when you're no longer releasing any eggs or the right. eggs you're releasing is not a good enough quality. And, and what happens once our ovaries are no longer releasing eggs, this is, as I said, this is where the adrenal glands come in. Mm -hmm. So we need the adrenal glands to do that job because the adrenal glands can produce um, progesterone. And it, it's everything that I said, we've got to support our adrenal glands by eating well, by reducing our stress, by moving. So we, it's living a healthy lifestyle. And when you yeah. do that, mm -hmm. the adrenal glands will produce exactly what it's required to produce. Mm -hmm. So, but it, you know, progesterone is a feel good hormone. Yeah. And it, it kind of calms you down. So then it's like, well, what can I do myself? What can I take control of myself to calm me down mm -hmm. or to, you know, reduce my stress rather yeah. than relying on the hormone to do it? So, you know, so it, I guess it could be, everyone's different. Tina's a bit younger than, than me. So um, I think she's still in our, our, she's in her late thirties. So she's probably still you know, but then her, her, um, her progesterone level, if, if she's still ovulating her progesterone and she's still ovulating healthy eggs, well, then she's her progesterone levels will be where they're required to be. Yeah, yeah. So, but if she's not ovulating um, or the eggs are not healthy, then we've got to look at that. So it's a difficult question to completely answer, but what I'm going yeah. to say is support your adrenal glands by living well. And do what you can to keep yourself healthy. Yeah. So um, I don't think I have any other questions. So what I'll do is I'll pop up links to all of your things. You've got a fabulous podcast. Um, you've got your website, which has got the, the free book about menopause on it and yep. your um, five day course. Um, and I'll put all that up there. So people, if, if they're seeing this, they can reach out to you. Yes. Um, is and there I'm, anything I'm, else that I'm, you'd like I'm to Angela add? I'm Council on all of the socials. So you just yes, find me I'll put your Facebook socials up there Instagram. as well. Yeah. So that'll go into the the um, description and, and things underneath. Is there anything else that you want to say to the women that are watching really, this? Really, don't be scared. Menopause yeah. is just a natural transition in life. It's actually, if you, it's time for you to be in control rather than leave your hormones to be in control because they're not in control. You be in control and you direct the outcome by looking after yourself, self-love, and know that this is the time where you step into your wisdom. This is our yes. wise women years. Uh, for the, you know, the previous half of our life, we have devoted ourselves to looking after children, parents, your, you know, husbands, all of that. Now it's your turn. Yeah. It's your turn. And one thing which came out from our last, the last program I ran is um, quite often we're running, we're looking after our parents because they're not aging well. We don't want to be that burden for our children. Yeah. So that's where we take responsibility so we don't become that burden for our children that sometimes our parents are for us. Yes. So your choice, you have the opportunity and you can be in control. So step up and get on it now, women. <laughs> well, I'll say thank you, Angela. It's been thank absolutely you. lovely speaking to you again. And, yeah, maybe we'll get you back on. Um, yep. 
Happy to. Down the path. <laughs> Okie dokes. Thanks. Bye-bye.